question. Okay. I think we'll ask Chief Inspector, and then we'll go from there. Why do police pull over young boys who wear all black and Air Max? This is the sort of question that would always come up, and quite rightly as well, because obviously some people do believe that they're targeted by the police, uh, and, and sometimes we are at, at fault, and sometimes we do get it wrong. Uh, but we've got a set criteria for how we can stop people, and we have to have uh, lots of different things in place, like there has to be something in law to stop a person, we have to have some sort of reasonable uh, suspicion that they've done something. So the officer has to be acting lawfully, before he can stop somebody. So, if you felt you were being stopped illegally, clearly you should be making complaints to the police. And if we've got it wrong, then we should be holding our officers to account. Okay, any other? Yep, there's a hand over here. You said before that previous question, right, that the young people have a right to walk in and make a complaint. Can I ask you as a percentage, right, should you know, how many young people, not advocates for young people, but young people walk in off the street into a station to actually make that sort of complaint about being stopped and searched? Yeah, and I think fairly obviously I'm not going to have the actual percentages for that type of question. But what I would say, yeah, I, I don't disagree. I'm not saying that kids are coming in and complaining. I'm saying that if, there's a, if we're at fault, they should come in and complain. And they don't have to do it themselves. It can be done through a parent or a guardian. So it can be done in different ways. Uh, and what I'm saying to you is that if we're getting it wrong, then make the complaint. And obviously it will be looked at. Didn't, didn't they bring a law out that if you got caught on that, you'd be sentenced for five years? That's for guns. Yeah, it, for carrying a gun. Did you say yeah, if I, they bring it out? No, didn't they bring a, a law out? If you got caught carrying knives, they'd be sentenced to five no, years. No, well, they, they did bring a law out saying that if you're carrying a knife, then you should look at imprisonment, particularly if it's not just the first offence. But, of course, the difficulty is there's the carrying of the knife, there's the producing of the knife and the using it. And, of course, as you go up the scale, the, the question of imprisonment is almost certain. But the five years comes in for carrying a gun or uh, supplying a gun. There's a mandatory sentence or minimum sentence of five years on top of any other offence. And if a person is 16 to 18, it's three years. What do you think started or motivates people into knife crime? I forgot to mention before, um, those people that don't know, I'm, I don't like to say a victim, I like to say I'm a survivor. I've lost two children, one to knife crime. Um, and obviously the mums that work with me, one of them being Pat, has also lost a daughter. But the question asked, I've been to, into many secure units, I've been to many prisons, and this is a question I've asked, why did you carry a knife and, you know, why were you carrying it? And a lot of the answers is for protection. They never ever, as the judge said before, never ever think they're going to use that knife. But all of a sudden they come into a situation. And I've spoken to people that have committed murder with knives and they said, I don't even remember doing it. I don't even remember stabbing. I've carried the knife that long and I just came into this situation. And this can happen to anybody. What support is there for somebody who's in a gang who wants to get out but thinks that they'll get shot if they try to leave? What support is there? Uh, anyone can answer that, to be honest. This is, a, this is a, something that is work in progress. Uh, it relies upon all of those services who have anything, any connection with the young person to work together and cooperate. If you are trying to get out of a gang and you are at, at risk as a result of trying to do that, your first port of call is probably the police to ask them for immediate support. However, if you are at, at school age, you can, the education authorities can help. Youth services can help. Um, we, can, we ought to be able to put together a package of support that would actually help. However, saying that and, and delivering it is a different matter. 
but uh... yeah, I think it's a, it's a difficult area that that um, uh, certainly um, I've been doing the role I do for about six months, and in that time, I think we've had two people who their their details have been brought to the multi-agency response for guns and gangs, and those two people have been brought to us, and they've said they want to get out, and it's been very difficult for us to actually get somebody to lead on that because it doesn't always have to be the police because sometimes they don't want the police to be involved with them but they'll be they'll be happy to speak to somebody from housing perhaps so we have to identify who can be the lead on that so it is a difficult process but it's something that uh, as the commissioner says we do need to develop that program so that that is there for them i'm happy to take that away from this evening as an idea that that we clearly need a better answer on and we need to be able to i'll work with peter brennan at the other end of the table we work together on reducing crime in liverpool and making liverpool as safe a place as we can we can work together on that to decide who ought to be the best agency to take that forward Thanks I, think, for that. I think also one of the things is not to keep it to yourself if you want to come out of a gang is discuss it with somebody you know, there's always people around. I mean, that's a question Pat and I get asked nearly every day. And one of the things that I feel is, you know, because we've been in big discussions, is sometimes you can gradually fade yourself out of a gang. Not instantly just say, I'm walking away, but, you know, you can gradually fade yourself out. And there is ways, you know, because we've spoken to people that have been rehoused in different areas, you know, for certain reasons, and it, it can be done. It definitely can be done. You know, there's lots of... I know you get threats sometimes if you leave a gang and this is going to happen. But sometimes, I know you can't take them lightly, but sometimes they are idle threats as well. And it is better to speak to somebody, you know. At the North Liverpool Community Justice Centre, we've had a lot of contact with um, the organisation from Brooklyn called Red Hook, which is also a community justice centre. And they... Liverpool, North Liverpool was built on the back of, of Red Hook, it's the same model, but they've been over and they're quite evangelical about what they call call-in courts and basically the major gangs are brought together within the court system, but there's armed police in, in these courts as well. It's a problem-solving court where there is a, a vision of all the agencies being there because something like 50 or 60 percent of the people that are in gangs that we've seen on the video don't want to be in a gang. And the research, some of the research that's come out of London, for example, said that these gangs are substitute families because there's deficits within the family structure, people are gravitating towards gangs. So it's a complex area. But certainly the Americans, for what it's worth, have these call-ins, and they bring the, the major players together within, within a controlled environment, and, and the, the armed police are there. Uh, because you could imagine in Liverpool, for example, bringing you know, Norris Green and Croxter together, the gangs there, and bringing them together. It would need to be you know, handled very carefully. Um, but it's a problem-solving approach, and people are offered the support. I mean, we do know, don't we, that young people, you know, there's three things that will keep young people out of offending. What, one is a good relationship. The other is employment. And the third thing, obviously, is your peers, the people that you mix with. It was seen in the echo that the council will have to cut youth services. Do you think it will increase gun and knife crime? I think what, we've, what, what we're looking at is um, this next year, as a council, we've got to try and save £32 million, um, and that's on top of £141 million we've already yeah, taken in the last two the years, yeah. and that's because the government grants that we've been getting, we get 80% of funding in Liverpool from central government, and the rest is made up from grants, car parking, council tax, the other 20% is a mixture of, of lots of other things. So as, as a city, uh, we get 80% funding from the, from the government, of which they're cutting that, and they're cutting that right to the bone, and it's getting passed on to us. So what we've got to do as a, as a city council, and very, very, very reluctantly, we've got to look at all the services that we provide, and we have to look at what we can and can't do when we're, when we're looking at £32 million worth of cuts because everybody's got a priority. So we have a priority to youth services. Other people will have a priority to adult social care, children's social care. 
some people may have a priority around libraries and um, some people may have a priority around dare, dare i say it, golf courses yeah. but their priorities for, for other people out there and what we've got to grapple with as, as a council we're actually down and if anyone's if anyone's listened to uh, mayor anderson over the last few months and um, he's been saying we are now down to prioritizing our priorities and sadly we've got to we've got to try and look at um, the most vulnerable in, in our society and in our city and try and protect <coughs> them services and they're mainly frontline services that are statutory which means we have got to provide by law we've got no choice now so when you're getting less and less and less and less money and you've got services there that you cannot touch you've got it fund then others have got to go and painful as it is and we don't like to do it and certainly myself i i've, I've spent as i said earlier most of my adult working life in youth services or working for young people and to act, to have to look at them kind of cuts it really is depressing and it really does hurt me and it hurts other other people because once that's gone it's gone young people are more and more being disadvantaged at every level there's less youth clubs there's less things for them to do there's less sports centers there's less opportunity for employment there's less um, um apprenticeships there seems to be more and more for less going out and we, we will reap what we sow now if we're not careful and if we don't look after young people we look after pensioners because they have a vote but we tend not to look after young people as much because they don't have a vote this this has been an issue that we've we've discussed at the council just this last week and particularly in the education select committee because what we're finding is some young people are not going to school thursdays and fridays because parents basically haven't got the bus fare for them to get there and some young people are also walking to school because they're using the bus fares that they've got to buy food or to buy a breakfast now if they haven't got that what will they do they may turn to thieving to get fed and that's not just young people that's adults as well we, we are looking at it and, and we, the, the council has set up a child poverty action group to look at this and one of the main things is is the is the fears now a year ago the bus fares went up uh, for young people they went up by two thirds so young people are almost paying the same fare uh, i don't use the buses but they're paying almost the same fare as an adult to go one stop now, if, if, if you're not within the, the three miles, whatever it is, three and a half miles, you won't get a free bus pass or a concessionary pass. So what we're looking at as a council is, we're actually trying to, and if there's anyone from Arriva that, that are here, maybe you could have a word, but we're actually trying to embarrass Arriva into saying, can't you bring your fares down? It's happened in Sheffield, it's happened in Birmingham, where, where the bus companies have looked at it, and they've reduced the fares for young people. Because what we're looking at, and what we're saying is, and, and certainly what we're seeing, is Thursdays and Fridays, and the schools are telling us, telling us as a council, they're the two days when the numbers of young people attending school drops, and it's down to the bus fares. Do any of you think that uh, personal experiences, such as like bullying or something, will make uh, people feel more inclined to carry knives around as like protection? And uh, do, you that will, like, do you reckon that results in an increase in uh, knife or gun crime? Oh yeah, the, the, I think there's absolutely no doubt that peer pressure plays a real big role in, in all of this. Uh, and that's just even to, that's to commit the offences as well that take place. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there's no doubt about it that uh, people carry weapons because they feel they either should or they need to or there's peer pressure for them to do that, no doubt. I was working in the yachts um, in Wavertree and this poor, I say poor young lad, he'd gone in the park on his bike and he actually pulled his trousers down to show us and his backside had been slashed really bad. So he thought to himself, well next time I go into that park, he'd never been in trouble, I'll take a knife with me to, to protect myself. Didn't he get picked up and get done for carrying a knife? You know, but he took it because he'd been stabbed. You know, his backside was in a terrible state. He hadn't, you know, committed a crime any time before that. That was the first time he'd gone out with a knife and he'd been done, you know, for carrying a knife. You know, so people do take it for protection. 
I think it's worth remembering though that we're talking about really small percentages here as well, mm -hmm. and, and, and Liverpool is a safe place. You should remember that Liverpool is a safe place to be. Yeah. We hear in the media a lot of negative uh, press, isn't there, about about Liverpool itself? But it's actually, I think, it's the second safest city uh, within England. So, you know, it, it's not all negative. There's lots of good things that go on and have gone on for many years. Crime has come down over the last few years. Antisocial behaviour has come down. And what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're on top of it if we see any spikes. And, of course, last year we saw the odd little spike in things like firearms discharges. And, and we've been dealing with that uh, as a, from a multi-agency approach uh, for the best part of 12 months. And we've seen really good uh, reductions in all those sort of areas. Why don't ex-offenders, when they come out of prison, go into the army? People have free choice, don't they? Yeah. You can only take a horse to water. And as my colleague said to you before, you've got to make a de you've got to accept some responsibility for your own lives. And, and there's consequences. And you either take the right road or the wrong road. And I know that sounds very religious, but you, you can't put it much clearer. And um, I imagine, as I said before, you're disadvantaged if you've got a criminal record and you're applying to go into the armed forces. But I'm happy for someone to correct me on the panel. Is that, is that right, Jane? Well, first of all, the arm, joining the, the armed services isn't a punishment. Uh, it is a highly professional and very responsible role where you are given responsibility for learning how to use guns in a legal setting. Why aren't the uh, police patrolling the streets instead of um, it sitting, sitting in the police station or in the cars waiting for a phone call? Firstly, firstly yeah, I mean, last year we did have a, we did, we had a bit of a spike with uh, what, a spike in what we call uh, firearms discharges that took place and, and obviously we responded to that. What I would say is that we have, we have dedicated patrols who actually respond and deal with uh, uh, gun and knife crime issues. Um, they work out of Walton Lane Police Station just around the corner here. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, as a manager within, within Merseyside Police, I, I would be very unhappy if we went to a police station and there were police officers sitting around doing nothing. And I can assure you that, uh, that, you know, that doesn't happen. Police officers are chased out and given roles to do. And of course, uh, they have to be given opportunities to do some paperwork sometimes but generally our police officers are chased out onto the streets and, and they do patrol and we target where we, where we patrol so we know where our, what we call our hot spots are. Can I please just say a big thank you to everyone for coming but especially to the panel for coming and giving their time. Um,